Good morning. I'm Brian Curtis. And I'm Doug Krisner. Here are the stories we're following today. President Biden is vowing to retaliate after another attack on a U.S. military base by Iran-backed militants. Ed Baxter has the story and more in San Francisco, Ed. Yeah, right. You're right, Brian. An attack in Jordan killed three military, wounded 25 others. It was a drone attack. The official line from the White House is that officials are still gathering details and will act. Former CIA senior operations officer Daryl Blocker tells ABC this is not really new. The administration has been dealing with this for over a decade. I know it seems new in the in the sense of the Hamas kind of angle to it now, but our forces and our our partners in the region have been fighting this and dealing with this issue for a long time. Yeah, the new chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, meanwhile, General C.Q. Brown, says the questions in the Middle East boil down to deterrence. Do they want a broader conflict? Do you want us in a full-scale war? Um, and that's the goal is to, uh, to deter them, and we don't want to go down a path of greater escalation that uh, drives to a much broader conflict. Um, within the region. Yeah, Brown says a constant balancing act. President Biden's energy security, uh, security advisor, Amos Hochstein, on CBS has heard on Bloomberg, says the impact of Houthi rebel attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea is limited and that any impact on the U.S. economy will be very, his word, muted, but says we should all be concerned. We want to do everything we can to prevent an escalation of that uh, lower level conflict into an all out conflict that would uh, drag us further into war and risk civilian lives on both sides. And that's what we're trying to do is to avoid that. That's why he says cost pressures have been more on logistics than on energy commodities. There are reports out of D.C. that the Senate negotiators are making progress toward an immigration compromise bill. One of the architects is Republican James Lankford, and on CBS has heard on Bloomberg says very high hopes. Uh, everyone's looking to be able to read the bill at this point. That's the key aspect. We're working on the final uh, aspects of it to try to be able to get it out so everyone can get a chance to read it. Right now, they're all functioning off of Internet rumors of what's in the bill, and many of them are false. Yeah, and he says people want to go through it and look at it for themselves. Donald Trump, meanwhile, as you know, said he uh, doesn't want it passed, and Democrat Tim Kaine says that makes no sense. We know that fentanyl is coming over the border from Mexico, largely through ports of entry. This bill will help us deal with that. And that's why when a President Trump says vote no, wait for a year, wait for two years, uh, people can't wait. Uh, Biden is endorsing it. The House will be another matter. And fentanyl also an issue for U.S.-China relations. Officials are set to meet in Beijing this week to talk about China clamping down on the trafficking of the deadly drug. It marks the first uh, person discussion of a group set up following the November meeting between Presidents Biden and Xi. Global News 24 hours a day, whenever you want it, with Bloomberg News Now in San Francisco. I'm Ed Baxter, and this is Bloomberg. Brian. Ed, thanks very much. The time now, six minutes past the hour. It's now time to take a look at the top business stories of the hour. Well, Wall Street is looking ahead to an extremely busy week for earnings news, specifically by big technology companies. And the expectations are high. Nadia Lovell is senior U.S. equity strategist at UBS Financial Services. We do expect tech to be able to deliver on the mm -hmm. earnings. Some of our early checks are already pointing to that. So we think that this market can continue to be a grind high. Now, in fairness, you know, the market is not too far from our base case scenario for 5,000 on the S&P 500. Among the companies, Alphabet, Microsoft, AMD, General Motors, Starbucks, UPS, and Pfizer, and that's all in the Tuesday session alone. And by the way, if you're tracking this, communication and tech are the two top sectors in the S&P 500 so far this year. Doug? So the Biden administration is set to announce massive subsidies for the chip makers by the end of March. Now, these companies obviously include names like Intel, even Taiwan Semiconductor is on the list. The grants, you may know, are a central piece of the 2022 Chips and Science Act. $39 billion has been earmarked as a way of revitalizing the American chip industry. Intel has said in the past the grants will determine how quickly the company can progress with expansion projects. Now, that that would include projects in Arizona and Ohio. The grants are aimed at rebalancing what is seen in Washington as a dangerous concentration of production in East Asia. It's also a key pillar of Mr. Biden's economic message as he heads to the November election, right? Well, China will halt the lending of certain shares for short selling beginning today. Bloomberg's Joanne Wong has the story from Hong Kong. 
The China Securities Regulatory Commission is moving to support the country's slumping stock markets. Strategic investors will not be allowed to lend out shares during lockup periods. Authorities are taking measures following an alarming slide in Chinese stocks. The MSCI China index has lost 60 percent from a 2021 high. The CSRC also vowed yesterday to crack down on other lockup restrictions, including the timing of the stock lending. In Hong Kong, Joanne Wong, Bloomberg Radio. And one of the other big stories today in Hong Kong will be Evergrande back in court here in Hong Kong. It's been eight weeks since the big developer was given some extra time uh, to try to come to a deal with creditors. uh, And what we're hearing from investors and from those creditors, no deal really uh, has been made. And so it'll be very interesting to see what the judge decides today, whether there's another delay or whether or not perhaps we move forward towards liquidation. Well, joining us now on the program is Principal Senior Portfolio Manager and Head of Fixed Income at New Edge Wealth, Ben Emmons. So, Ben, a lot to talk about. Um, I know we've got the uh, refunding coming tomorrow, so that's one thing. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about the Fed and inflation first. Uh, The Fed may be close to a pivot, and I think people are are sensing that. That's one of the reasons we've seen some buoyancy in the markets. But one of our featured stories on the terminal is uh, it has a restaurant that's saying, Look, we've kept prices steady for a couple of years, but we don't think we can continue. Is the public feeling the slowdown in inflation? Hey, Brian, um, it's it's very mixed uh, picture on the ground here because, you know, as much as that core PCE data sh- is very encouraging and it shows that so that all these annualized measures are actually at or even below the target now, you know, it's still a, a bifurcation in terms of, as you mentioned, like if you go to any kind of restaurant here, you're not really seeing those three or six month annualized uh, inflation rates uh, being below 2%, right? You're paying triple of, of that type of uh, inflation. And that still has a lot to do with, I think, the shock out of Ukraine from, from 2022 that still to an extent reverberates, uh, you know, through food oils and other, other kinds of processing of foods that has left food prices just more elevated. So it's not so simple, but there is in that sense, in the broad picture, the, the, let's say the progress that the Fed can look at saying we we'll have pretty restrictive rates in their mind and inflation is moving really towards the target quicker. So there's a case here for reducing that rate, I think, sometime in the second quarter. But as we just went through the top headlines, we already have new challenges coming at us, like, for example, what's happening in the Middle East, there's energy prices, right? So it's all not that clear cut to me the Fed can move so quickly, so fast on, on rate cuts here. So, Ed, uh, Ben, do you think that we're going to be looking at a situation where it's higher for longer, maybe the third quarter of the year, not not the, the second quarter? It would be more our view, Doc. I mean, we, we, we're certainly not subscribing to the view of, of a March cut, because that means that any day that until then would really see like a significant weakening, and it's actually the opposite that's happening, uh, even though inflation is moving down. And if this economy holds up and it's still getting essentially a stimulus from, so to speak, moderating inflation, yeah, you're looking at a higher for longer into, into the well into the summer. And that's, I think, a very well a possibility. You know, we have this deluge uh, in the bond market. It seems to be uh, getting absorbed pretty well. We haven't had all that much pain. I I can refer to the the two-year yield that started the year at about 425, and we're only at 434 now. So, uh, And it seems like investors are interested in in loading up here at these high rates before they eventually start to move down. Um, is, is Is that right? Should they feel that way? Yeah, it's a very conditioned view, right, in terms of, like, how, where we came from pre-pandemic. And, again, if all those annualized measures of inflation show were at pre-pandemic levels, that's what incentivizes those investors to say, I'm not going to wait, I'm going to buy the bonds now, because we're going to get there one way or the other, right? And, and therefore, I think, as you mentioned, the refunding coming up this week, but maybe more supply and more in the long run, who knows? You know, in the end of the day, there's, there seems to be a, a better demand picture here, Caution, though, that the last number of auctions have shown challenges in terms of getting it you know, properly covered, with primary dealers still taking down a lot of, the, of the, the supply in that auction. So it's not entirely, I think, a healthy picture. But let's say this. I think, Brian, we, we probably have reached some level of peak in Treasury yields last year. And we may go back towards that peak temporarily, given the strength of the economy. But to see 6 7% yields, uh, that will probably be more about a, a fiscal crisis or a major energy crisis, which neither of that is happening right now. 
Yeah, and as we speak, I mean, we've got crude oil uh, at around uh, just under 79 a barrel. That's WTI. You, you made a, a, a point a moment ago where you said you think that the Fed's view on rates is that they're pretty much restrictive at this point. And I'm wondering, as we head into the remainder of this year and then look out to 2025 and the amount of debt that has to be rolled over, essentially, and refinanced, whether the Fed is cognizant of that and that would the Fed would be inclined to try to get to rate cuts sooner rather than later if inflation is at the Fed's back because of the awareness of how much financial stress may be building in the system. I think we cannot uh, ignore that indeed, Doug. You know, you know, if you just step back a year, less than a year ago about the, the, the banking crisis that suddenly erupted, right, which was an effect of well, on one hand, interest rate risk, but on the other hand, just the fact that we have debt in the system that's causing friction. Um, yes, the rollover of, of commercial real estate debt and of other uh, corporate debt and high yield is major, and, and including government debt. So there is indeed a relief of rates to an extent needed. Now, we got it already from the October high at 504 and the 10-year to as low as, as 385 or so recently. But we probably need some more stability uh, from here to get indeed a, that rollover uh, sufficient enough without major disruption. So to an extent, the Fed has the inflation wind in its back. Could probably get to that rate cut. We do think it will happen, um, but maybe later this year. So before the election, but sometime in, in the late summer and in the fall, keeping that financial conditions effect from that rollover, that that's certainly a mind. Yeah, but Ben, I mean, the layman would say, look, corporate America and individuals, particularly uh, homeowners, had 15 years of refinancing and getting their loans, you know, into a pretty affordable rate. And that's the lion's share. What you guys have just been talking about is just a sliver over the past short period when rates were high, right? That's true. I think that, you know, if, if, you, if you look back before the pandemic happened, all that refinancing then at that low rate and the terming out of that, that's part of the reason why we haven't had any problems so far with high rates affecting the economy. It's generally acknowledged now that particularly corporations, including households, have been able to weather the, the interest rate storm, so to speak. Right? They, they, their interest rate, average interest cost is, is lower than when market rates are currently the reset of that interest rate cost is what the concern is, and it's a bit difficult to point exactly how much that will be, but there are groups of, of companies out there that have to refinance starting this year into next year, and that's the issue. So I do think the Fed keeps it in mind, but it's all, obviously all about financial conditions and that type of analysis for them to consider the debt rollover. Ben, before we let you go, we got to talk China. You and I were kind of a trading email earlier. Um, one of the things that you highlighted was this piece in the Washington Post on uh, President, former President Trump reportedly weighing options for a new economic attack on China and reading between the lines. I mean, it's pretty apparent what the strategy would be. Let's, let's jack up tariffs. What do you think the net impact on the American economy would be imagining a world where we're looking at uh, higher tariffs on Chinese goods? Yeah, it would be very uh, disruptive, I think. I would agree with the article's premise because you bring fence the economy with tariffs the theory is that you will give the, the producers the, the, the all-out competition to raise cri- prices, right? They don't have any foreign competition, you know, in theory. <laughs> you know, it's not that straightforward, but I do think that pr- domestic production will be in cost much higher going forward, right, given the tariff uh, impact. And, you know, we are currently getting very gentle deflation from China, once again, right? And it's helping our economy, really. If, if, if you think, if think of all the categories of goods that are now much lower in price than they were a year ago or two years ago. So I think the, the tariff is, is once again in a very disruptive measure and has shown from different you know, think tanks, independent think tanks here, so, that so, it has so is, let, let the job losses, yeah. So is a vote for Trump a, a you know, get, get ready for more inflation kind of vote? Yeah, I, it, it's a bit political, Brian, but I think that – the, the impact on, of tariffs on inflation has been sort of mixed from the previous uh, situation. How this will be with a, with a, with a universal tariff, maybe there will yeah. be higher inflation, definitely will mm. affect the economy negatively. I would say yeah. that's the vote. Yeah, because one analysis says that he's planning or thinking about 10% on all countries for tariffs. 
And I know that, that's not just China, and that would make a huge, huge difference. Ben, thanks very much for joining us. Ben Emmons from New Edge Well. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, your morning brief on the stories making news from Hong Kong to Singapore and Wall Street. Look for us on your podcast feed every day on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcast. You can also listen live each day on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Brian Curtis. And I'm Doug Krisner. Join us again tomorrow for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia.